We'll look at one from online. Okay, so um, this is a very interesting one. Um, how how to gain WeChat followers, specifically WeChat followers. Let me start by asking Mike. What do you think about that one? Uh, it's funny, I was just writing a, I was just responding to an RFP about this. It's very weak, it's also very WeChat focused. For us, it's, it's concentrate on content, and that's your two-pronged approach, but you have to have a layer of marketing underneath to support that. And it could, <clears throat> I'm sure Kim can touch on a little bit about this, but we, we focus on KOLs, we focus on uh, media strategy, looking at the entire destination on how we can be involved in different places because even if you're building uh, WeChat followers and you're, the obvious approach of course, WeChat ads, uh, geo-targeting, being able to purchase through there. The creative way is uh, spreading your content out, getting people to recognize you more. Uh, and then using those channels as additional pieces of promotion because it's becoming more and more difficult to get real WeChat followers because the market itself is becoming more and more competitive. Kim, do you have any uh, thoughts on that? I think they want you to move on to camera. Oh. You're currently off screen. Move over. Sorry. <laughs> I have to be in the live stream to be in the live stream? Okay. Um, yeah, from, from our perspective, uh, KOLs are both the content creators as well as distribution for your content, right? And they can bring their followers and audience to your community with, with the right level of storytelling. So oftentimes we see brands when, and organizations when they're first starting out, um, they're very much working with KOLs to create some of that initial content so it has legs in distribution. Um, because when you're just creating content and you don't have any followers, it's very hard for that to get seeded. So that's that's usually what we see. Cool. Thanks very much. We have an audience question. Just, just on the brand ambassadorship, and as you said, it's a very difficult thing to build. When you're selecting, a, I suppose, a partnership between a brand ambassador and a brand, you know, how long is that relationship expected to last, and is that something that goes beyond what would start off as being financial and to be something that is, you know, obviously there's always money involved, but something that is a, becomes a team, of a team thing to grow you know, a product or a brand. So, so, to, so the question was, um, how do you grow a brand ambassadorship program? And then specifically, how long do those last for? Um, and three, like, what do those kind of arrangements look like, right? So, so the first question, um, for a lot of organizations, you want to first test and iterate, right, before you scale up these kind of programs. So um, I'll give an example. It's a, a company we're working with that's specifically Irish and UK baby products. And they happened to find a Chinese mom who had just relocated there. And so she live streams every day. And um, she started with, she was very much a micro-influencer who just had a couple hundred to now 10,000 views per live stream. And on top of that, actually directs um, WeChat followers and traffic to their WeChat shop. So um, that's a very geolocation-based um, brand ambassadorship program. And what started as purely like product gifting, as I mentioned in my presentation, it is now something that they're looking to test and roll out and not necessarily... Um, Chinese live streamers who are located in Ireland, for example. So, so I think that's like one example. And the question is, how long? Usually, brands are pretty experienced at this. Are doing are looking for something that will be at least several months, say, you know, six months, six to twelve months. Um, and it does require the content to engage them over that period of time. So, if you were working with like a top tier influencer and they came to your destination and they made the experience. You want to make sure that they have enough content so they can actually post that content following the event, right? And uh, not necessarily during, not just for only during when they were there, but then afterwards. Cool. Thanks very much, Kim. I know Mike has um, a bit of experience with more sort of longer term KOL relationships. Do you want to add anything to that? I think it really depends on uh, the type of, like, I should say, the, the type of influencer. So if you have like a celebrity, I mean, more, more than likely, if you want the celebrity to be your brand ambassador, the longer they're your brand ambassador, the more effective it's going to be for your brand. But the choice of that celebrity is also very important. You know, we've had some clients in the past to go do a lot of background checks on them. 
because you never know what kind of things that they've hit in the past. Some brands are more sensitive to um, some things that the KL has done in the past. Even in China, sometimes it doesn't really matter as much. But uh, for the most part, all our clients who work overseas, they care about that stuff. And they expect uh, either you or your agency to do a good background check to make sure that uh, whoever's representing you over the long haul um, is clean, represents your well, represents your culture, represents uh, your, your messaging. Um, and that alignment is just supremely important as you're starting to grow your brand in, in the market. Okay, so I'm just curious, like, uh, in your experience, um, like nowadays, the users of WeChat or Weibo have more tolerance or less tolerance to, to see the ads of a um, so that question, let me just repeat it for our live stream viewers. Are the followers on uh, WeChat and Weibo um, more or less tolerant to KOL's advertising for brands? Kim, I'll start with you. Well, the Chinese consumer is very savvy. They know when there's sponsored content and when there's not. And what matters is whether or not the content is good. Whether it was informative, whether it was a good story, whether it was entertaining, whether the photos and the video were well produced. Um, this has been on since the age of time of Weibo, which is not so long ago. And and so I think it comes down to, is the content something the audience wants to see? Uh, just before I pass over to Mike, I mean, they recently um, changed the regulations on WeChat. So you now are forced to declare right, if your um, content is sponsored and you can get in trouble if you're found out, right? You know, I, I could talk a little bit more about that. I think um, you guys who are the brand owners who represent your brand, you know the brand better than anyone else. Well, you should, anyways. Um, and when you work with the KOL, you can control, you see the types of methods that you could work with the KOL. You can control everything from what they write about to what you want other people to convey and I mean you can even get creative where you can get multiple chaos converse with each other to make it seem natural as well um, I think from a marketing strategy point of view it all depends on uh, your messaging at the end of the day um, if you let them control too much of your message too much of the messaging it could might hurt your brand in the in the long run um, but if you have more control of your brand in the short term and you're able to strategize with them to get them excited or uh, sound more natural even from a tone um, I think it's less likely for them to be like for you like followers or people that think that it's it's an ad and Really like nobody likes ads like that's just the way it well, We think it's about guidelines as opposed to creative control because fundamentally the KOL knows What their audience like but what they really need from brand marketers is the, the information right they need they that that's that, you know, the, the insider's perspective on what to do in New York. Like, they need the content and support from that regard. So that's what makes them author the authorities on, on the subject. Cool. Thanks very much. Um, we have a couple of questions coming from the uh, comments on live stream. We've got a softball one first. They said, any recommendation for a social media tool? Well, I can definitely recommend uh, KO for that one. <laughs> So thanks for that question, whoever asked that. Um, they also asked about uh, social listening. Um, we don't actually do social listening, but there are some uh, pretty good platforms out there. Um, social listening is generally um, a bit more expensive. You can look at, um, depending on what you're, you're wanting, social listening on WeChat is very hard. And um, from the data we see, it can't really be trusted that well. But uh, there are platforms like um, Raiderly from the company uh, Linkfluence, who um, we have worked with, and they're generally um, very good for social listening, so you can contact them about a campaign. Um, I'm now going to switch to another question that might be quite relevant um, for uh, some smaller brands um, out there, which is, where do you start with um, attracting Chinese tourists? Let, I mean, this is this is a very interesting question because we get this quite a lot, and um, I think maybe Mike will have some uh, something to say on this. Like, if you're if you're, you know, if you're having, I was looking at the question that the banner, I was like, oh, what am I going to say for that? And then I was like, wait a second, that's not the question. So yeah, what was it? So the the question is, where do you start if you're doing nothing right now? What's the best place to start? And, you know, how much is that going to cost? And, and what does that look like? Because there are lots of brands; they're already up and running, and they're spending, um, you know. Thousands, not millions, but where do you start if you've got nothing going on? I think the most important thing is to state your goals and objectives 
I think that you have to be very, very clear about because social media is a long-term play. It's it, 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 and in some cases, it's it's about um, understanding that a lot of a lot of brands think that they can come into a market and then all of a sudden just hey, where's my followers? There's there's uh, 1.4 billion people in China. What do you mean you can't get me 50,000 followers? Um, and it's also uh, to be aligned with uh, whether it's your internal team or external team, what your KPIs and what are the most important things like how do you measure followers versus engagement? What's actually the most important thing to you and what should be most important thing? So if you're a new brand starting in market, do your research first. I think research comes at the very beginning, um, understanding who your consumers are, because your consumers are going to be very different depending on uh, which vertical of business you're under. Um, I would recommend to even before you jump on social, um, do small uh, like sessions to understand uh, key questions that you want to find out about, because then that can build your content strategy. That can tell you what your KOL strategy should be. And so then you produce content that people actually want to read, because um, to me, that's the most important thing, is that preparation in the beginning, before you even get started onto a social media platform and get on Weibo, you have to know what direction you're going to be going um, along the way. Kim, how about you? Where should, where should brands start? <laughs> Hire the right person. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, it starts with the the right boots on the ground. Um, you know, I think you did a great show of was it Wendy and mm, Eric, Eric yeah. right? Um, I think that that is that is where it all starts is actually the people with, um, with your marketing strategy. And um, in some respects, um, you have agencies that will help you with this in the beginning, but eventually your organization knows the destination and the product best, right? So, uh, Starts with mailman. <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I would just extend a little bit, like on, on the focus groups. Um, you know, really good KOLs do this too. They ask their fans, what content do you want me to do, right? And so they have the fortune of actually having a dedicated uh, following that they can query that to. Um, and I think given that it's so easy now to search on social, to see what um, tourists are actually taking photos of and talking about your destination, that is something, the data is out there, right? Um, and that doesn't even necessarily require a fancy social listening tool in the beginning to do that. Yeah. Um, so that's where I would start. And find out, like, and, look, and really understand, like, who is the traveler you're targeting? You know, is it families? Is it um, independent travelers, millennials? Like this is this is very much first know who your target group is. Okay, I just want to ask one very simple question. Um, if a brand's thinking of getting started, what would you say is the absolute minimum they can spend on a monthly basis to get started marketing to Chinese tourists? <laughs> just give me, just give me a number. <laughs> I'm only the KOL part. I'm. <laughs> Uh, nothing's free. Um, <laughs> look, I think you have to look at social as an investment, like I said. Um, for us, we, we hire people who are uh, experienced in the field of writing in for Chinese consumers. Um, if you're serious about building a team, um, before we even give you a number of where you start, we have to understand, again, what your objectives are. And what your budget is, because there's no point to say, hey, a minimum cost for us is X amount per month. It's about um, understanding that if you're going to be going in with the agency, you are ready to go on that almost a luxury kind of path because you have to be ready to spend to build a team somewhere else. But if you're a brand that has that wants to start social, then you hire internal. You could probably find a digital editor. Um, and someone that can build and write content. The difference between from you hiring in-house versus hiring, uh, say, an agency like Mailman is that we put the strategic thinking behind uh, understanding your brand and guiding you in the market. Um, and so, yeah, there's additional cost for that. But I don't, I don't discourage anybody out there that goes, hey, I, I want to hire my own digital editor. I want to start uh, my own channel to write content. I think producing content is really important. But... The last point I'll make is that you have to respect the experience of people who actually write content, as in it's not just a 
Like, so, I mean, that was a great answer, but like, <laughs> what's the number? <laughs> like, what number should they not even bother calling you if they don't have that budget? For us, we we for us we actually say a minimum of say ten thousand U.S. dollars a month at the very minimum because we're looking at uh, building a team around you. Okay, so I can give you at that as a general number. We say as a minimum, it might not even include any media budget or anything that include uh, uh, that encompasses into that particular budget. But um, we're we create an agency that offers a different level of service in our opinion. Um, and we've been able to build that reputation over the last five years. So, I mean, if you are looking to do it really lean, then I mean, KWO would allow you to sort of help self-manage. Oh, absolutely! <laughs> yeah. And and KWO only starts from two hundred US a month. <laughs> um, so, Kim, you what? Make me sound expensive. Well. <laughs> um. So I'm speaking for. Okay, so I, I I think there are two very different kinds of budgets, basically. There are SMEs, and then you have global organizations, which um, are investing very heavily in multiple marketing channels, right? Um, but what we are seeing is a growth and investment in KOL, both in China and as well as outside China. So um, you'll see statistics for SMEs, both in China and outside China, it's 80% of their marketing budget will go to KOL, right? And it very, depends, it very much depends on their strategy. China's a market where over half of the top apparel tabout sellers are KOLs, right? The KOLs today build their own businesses, right? Um, they are content creators, and this is something that is very much not going away and a significant portion of people's budgets. So um, from our perspective, we, we do see companies doing it from a lean way, but it does take a lot of relationship building, um, a lot of in-kind exchange, um, for something like travel, it's very much about gifting experiences. That's, and that has a cost to it, right? Flights, accommodation, there's a cost to that. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, we, we, we see brands who are at least at a minimum willing to dedicate 100,000 US being the most successful because you, you get what you invest in. Um, and then we've also seen leaner budgets where they're doing KOL campaigns for even like 10,000 US. Um, Park Lu, our, our subscription-based platform, which gives you access to 10,000 plus travel, fashion, lifestyle influencers, you know, we start, we have two, two options, and basically subscription-based is 500 US a month. Is that it again? It's 500 US a month. It's on our so just um, kind of, I think I think you uh, you answered another question we just had coming on live stream about KOL budgets. So um, that I'll have to look for another question for us to ask now. Does anybody in the audience have one? No. Okay. We do have another question that was submitted in advance from Sarah in the US, and she wants to know about um, when it comes to selling our features and benefits. Are there certain factors that a Chinese traveller is looking for in an American travel experience? To be honest, you probably have one of the world exports, but it's in uh, American travel for Chinese tourists I've, right next to me. I've probably talked about this quite a bit in the past. I think what makes a real difference between a Chinese traveler and anywhere else is that uh, the language is very different. It's very important to talk to them in the way that they like to read. Um, but most importantly, uh, if I say the most, is that Chinese people, they like details. I mean, if you are writing, if it's a KOL writing a blog or anything like that, don't be afraid if it's 15 pages long. We've, we've handed off a project once to uh, a writer who wrote about renting a car. And you would think that that is like the most basic thing. But she came back and wrote a 15-page booklet about how to rent a car in the U.S. And the feedback there was that they all loved that. Everyone loved it. Because... We as, I mean, I would say we, but like, you know, if you're an American or you're a Western person, you think of renting a car, that's very straightforward. Go on the site, pick your car, make sure, whatever, click all the boxes. But the Chinese person wants to know about what am I clicking? And it, it, what, what clicking, what car should I rent? Uh, all the way down to what are the colors that, that mean on the side of the road? You know, every single tips and tricks that you can tell the person, they all take that as they're getting ahead of the game, right? If you can... Offer like, hey, if you go to this website, you get a coupon. This is the cheapest. Like, they love that stuff. You know, I'm I'm Chinese American. I base some of my experience on just my mother, so I know how Chinese people really think sometimes. And um, I think details are really important. And I, I'll give you one more example, which is we work with a travel blogger once, um, and he wrote basically three paragraphs 
about not forgetting to bring a water bottle onto the air, airplane. And it was like a tedious three paragraphs if I read it, but to, for a Chinese word, they're like, well, that's a good tip because there's no water when you get on the plane. So remember to definitely look around, shop around, and bring water onto the airplane. And those are little tidbits that really make uh, content successful because it comes from personal experience. And I think uh, when you look at attracting followers, you have to remember what are the things that Chinese people are used to, slippers, hot tea, hot water, all the way up until um, when you're writing content, what kind of content should you be writing and the length of content. Just to extend on that, when you mentioned personal experience. Yeah. Where does it sit with, with you know, Anglo-Saxon or Westerners personal experience versus the Chinese personal experience in terms of the influence or how much they're influenced by that? Because I think it's shifted the last couple of years that Chinese would prefer information from another Chinese person rather than a Western person telling them what they can and can't do. Yeah, I think it depends on the, the influencer. Um, I think... Uh, the Chinese person would like if you watch like a really popular some of these popular videos are the, why they're successful is because you're watching someone do it and they get excited over it think it's fun um, and that provides a different kind of influence to say if you're a Western person walking around just doing kind of like marketing fluff around a destination that won't provide a, as high of an influence but there's dependencies to that particular question and we can talk more. And that's awesome. Just to uh, catch that for the live stream in case nobody caught it, we're just asking why uh, is um, do people prefer their information to come from another Chinese person or a Western source? And I'll just uh, let Kim have a moment on that. <laughs> they want it from someone they trust. <laughs> it, it's no different. It's actually no different. Um, yeah, and uh, to talk about KOL some more. <laughs> um, they, a lot of them actually have been doing and creating content for quite a while. Oftentimes more than, it take, you know, you don't develop a following overnight. It usually takes a couple of years. So um, they've built trust with their audience. And, you know, even if they're sharing tips of advice like bringing water onto the plane, um, that's something that the, the readers really, you know, and fans really take into account. So, um, and they also know, okay, does this influencer fit my lifestyle? Do I is it aspirational? Do I you know do they fit my needs? Like is their lifestyle like mine? And, and that's a large part of it too. Uh, just, let me just add on one more thing: is that if you want to get ahead of the game, you're in a hotel, your airline, your anybody, just you can do very simple things that can organically get people to talk about your location. So I'll use slippers for example. If you ever go on a flight, you're flying to the states. You, I've once seen a Chinese person in economy try to steal the pair of slippers in business class just so he'll have the slippers to walk around in. Okay, you'd be surprised how many hotel chains that don't even provide this in the US. That means they're not conducive to the Chinese traveler. But if they do provide it and they have the hot water kettle and things like this, these are the these are the points where um, they'll go back and that's where word of mouth gets really important. You know, they'll post on their moments a bit, oh, this place is great. I mean, they might not go like, well, I got hot water. But if the experience is really good, there, there's multi-language available. You have ways to get them to talk about your location without you actually doing anything. Because those are the type of ambassadors that you want to start building, even beyond just uh, finding KOLs to go talk to about Everybody's your location. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, we just have one. We're going to take one more question from uh, online, um, and then uh, we'll, we'll see if we have time. I think we're running a little bit short on time. So, um, this last question is from uh, somebody from the Pandanus Beach Resort in Sri Lanka, and they're wanting to know specifically about premium um, Chinese travelers. Is there anything that's different about attracting premium Chinese travelers to uh, maybe the mass tourists? If you're a very high-end resort, what should you do differently? Well, premium travel. I know. Um, I think premium and luxury um, targeting is is very well. There's two parts of it. One of it is very much word of mouth, right? And two is um, particularly the travel segment. I think that actually these prestige uh, travel agencies are very important. 
because um, they are basically, uh, they have the networks to target these kinds of um, audiences. Whereas a premium travel KOL would actually be very, very niche. Because if you think about it, that content creation is very, very expensive, right? So, um, so from I mean, that would just be my candid advice. Um, though, the best way to attract um, uh, the best way to actually probably build awareness on premium travel experience is through actually probably celebrities. That's my guess. Um, you've seen this with Bali. We've seen this with New Zealand. We've seen this with UK. Celebrity weddings are um, huge. Um, in terms of building awareness for premium experiences. It's created a huge lift in um, Chinese weddings in Bali because of this. Mike, how about you? Well, I thought, do you have time? Yeah, just do you have anything to say on the premium sector of the market? Um, I don't have that much to say, actually. I think, um, <laughs> you know, we, we, we ran a couple of accounts with the you know, Luxury Resort. That was one of our clients before. Um, if, some people only want to attract a premium, but a lot of people who who look at luxury, they're looking at masses, right? Like, I, it's a weird example to float to, but if, say, for example, you're the NFL and you have all these people who already know about it, you're not going to keep wanting to talk to only those people. You're trying to expand your reach. So we focus on, when we're, run, run, say, back to the luxury example, we're going to look at different verticals, right? People, if it's about food, maybe you just talk a whole month about food or you talk about wedding, lo wedding locations that you can do over there. I think it, it can attract... Uh, weddings are huge, right? So you don't necessarily have to be luxury. That's the one time when people will spend more money and they're looking for the best locations. I have no experience about this, but I'm just... I was going to say, where was your <laughs> wedding? <laughs> okay, I think that's actually all we have time for today. Um, I'm sure the panel will hang around for a few minutes to ask, answer any other questions. And of course, once we upload this video onto YouTube or other platforms, you can ask questions in the comments and we will try and respond back to you. Um, I want to thank very much Mike from the Mailman Group and Kim from Park Blue and I'm Alex from KRO and thank you very much for tuning in today. Thanks. Thanks.